Did you know that Philadelphia was home to not just America's first museum and its first public zoo, but also its first working programmable computer? Or that Miami is the only major U.S. city to be formally founded by a woman? It's true! And as it turns out, there are countless pieces of unexpected and surprising trivia about virtually every place you've ever seen on a postcard. So, today we're excavating some unusual facts about well-known cities around the world. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and head down to the comments and let us know about what other urban topics you would like to hear about. Okay, we built this city on Weird History. When we think about old cities, many Americans' minds immediately jump to the most famed and storied destinations of the ancient world. Iconic, statue-filled locales like Rome or Carthage or Troy. But there are plenty of other spots on the map where humans have been living for thousands of years that don't have quite the same classical brand recognition. Take Portugal, for example. The area that's now Lisbon was first settled in 1200 BCE by Phoenicians in need of a trading post. That's 400 years before early Romans put down roots on the banks of the Tiber. It actually makes Lisbon the second oldest standing city in Europe, behind only Athens, Greece. Lisbon just doesn't have the same juice, antiquity-wise, because we have so much less documentation about what was going on there specifically during this time period. Eventually, it became part of the expanding Roman Empire. The area was ruled by Rome from 205 BCE up to 409 CE, before falling to various migratory peoples and tribes. North African Muslims, known as Moors, overran the Iberian Peninsula, including Lisbon, in the 8th century, before they, too, lost it in 1147 to its current owners, you know, the Portuguese. Paris is home to a number of memorable structures and landmarks from the Champs-Élysées and its famed Arc de Triomphe, to the Eiffel Tower, to that one fountain Inspector Clouseau falls into. But the city is also notable for what it lacks, namely, stop signs. The Parisian city government had them all removed in 2016. But even before that, there was just one stop sign in Paris, en quai Saint-Exupéry, in the 16th arrondissement. Due to its infamy, signs at the intersection kept getting stolen, leading the city government to ultimately cease replacing them, leaving the town utterly stop signless. Despite the lack of signage, the rules for motoring through intersections remain largely unchanged from most other big cities. In the absence of a traffic light, cars on the right have the right of way. And if there are no other cars present, you're not expected to stop. C'est facile. Along with Paris, London likely sits at the top of any American's list of the largest and most prominent European cities, if only due to its notoriety and central place in so much pop culture. But the city of London itself is actually one of England's smaller towns, by population. And that's because the actual technical city of London is much smaller than the area we think of when we just picture London, England in our heads. The city of London is basically just the center cluster of buildings downtown spread out over 1.12 square miles, comprising the financial district. During the day, this chunk of London swells up to around 513,000 people, but they're mostly commuters who travel there for work. In fact, the city of London itself only has around 8,000 residents, making it technically England's third smallest city, behind only St. David's and St. Asaph. The Grand Bazaar of Istanbul, Turkey, ranks among the world's largest and oldest covered markets. It is often regarded as history's first shopping mall. Construction started in the winter of 1455, shortly after the takeover of the former Byzantine capital by the Ottoman Empire. Back then, it was still known as Constantinople. You've probably heard the song. The Ottomans hoped that a large central market would help to stimulate economic prosperity in the city. So Sultan Mehmed II ordered one built close to his palace. Modern analysis of the building's brickwork demonstrates that there was some other Byzantine structure on the spot in the 15th century, but it's unknown what specifically the market replaced. At first, it was designed largely around the trading of textiles and jewelry, and was known as Jevahir Bedistan, or Bedistan of the Gems. The word Bedistan was derived from an old Persian term, and referred to a clothing market. 
Still, a number of goods that had also been popular for commerce in the city during its previous Byzantine era remained for sale in the new market, including slaves. The area had already taken on its final shape by the start of the 17th century, which it still mostly resembles to this day. Today, the market comprises more than 4,000 shops across 61 covered streets, taking up a total area of around 30,000 square miles and employing more than 26,000 people. Between 250,000 and 400,000 shoppers visit the bazaar each day, ranking it among the world's most popular tourist attractions. In fact, in 2014, Travel and Leisure declared the bazaar the world's number one most visited destination, with over 91.3 million annual visitors. That parking lot must be a nightmare on Ramadan Eve. Another iconic structure, Moscow's Kremlin, also has a long and storied history. The term Kremlin itself means fortress in a city. And in fact, it's the largest medieval fortress that's still in use by modern European leaders today. The land that's currently Moscow has been occupied continuously since around the second century BC, when it was the home of various Finnic people. Based on findings by Soviet archeologists, it's believed that the first fortified structure was built from wood on the site by a group known as the Vyatice around the year 1090. This first fortification was destroyed by Mongols in 1237, but later rebuilt by Moscow's Grand Prince Ivan Danilevich Kalita in 1339. When Prince Dmitry Donskoy fortified the structure in the 1360s, he was essentially laying the foundation that the building still sits on today. Nothing wrong with a hand-me-down fortress. You make it your own. Renaissance-era ruler Ivan III of Russia, also known as Ivan the Great, organized a grand reconstruction of the Kremlin and invited a number of skilled artisans from Italy to work on and design the new building. He added cathedrals, a banquet hall known as the Palace of Facets, and the Ivan the Great Bell Tower, which kind of sounds like the tower's name is Ivan and that we're all really proud of him. At the time, it was the tallest building in Muscovite Russia. The Kremlin's current walls, some of which stand over 60 feet high and 20 feet thick, were constructed between 1485 and 1495. Ivan III's grandson is credited with transforming Russia from a medieval state into a powerful empire, but at great cost to its people, earning him the nickname Ivan the Terrible. His addition to the Kremlin included the construction of St. Basil's Cathedral, the iconic Orthodox church in Red Square that a lot of people picture first when they hear the term the Kremlin, and the separation of the structure from the rest of the city by a wide moat. What's today the Indian city of Mumbai was once a collection of individual islands in the Middle Ages. The precise number is unknown, but most experts think it was around seven separate land masses. The area was settled by indigenous groups, including the Silahara dynasty and the Gujarat Sultanate, before being taken by the Portuguese in 1543. They were then handed over to England as part of a dowry, when Portugal's Catherine Braganza married Charles II in 1661. Sort of a thanks for marrying our daughter, here are some islands kind of situation. We've all been there. England's East India Company wanted to use the area as a large, unified port city and engaged in multiple land reclamation projects to bring the seven islands together. By 1845, the islands had been entirely merged like a metropolitan megazord, and the resulting city was named Bombay. The current southern part of the city of Mumbai sits atop the area. In the mid-1800s, a sandy, mile-long barrier island appeared off the southern coast of Rockaway Beach in Queens, New York. Over time, it came to be known as Hog Island due to its similarity in shape to a hog's back. And unfortunately, not because it was an island run entirely by pigs. Initially just a curiosity, the island ultimately became home to a number of seafront businesses, including saloons, restaurants, public baths, and other leisure activities and tourist traps. It even became a popular getaway for the city's most powerful Tammany Hall politicians of the era. Sadly, Hog Island was a short-lived phenomenon. A series of winter storms in 1893, followed by a devastating hurricane that briefly made landfall in New York, caused the island to essentially disappear overnight. By 1902, there was little visible evidence it had ever existed. Interest in Hog Island was revived by a string of storms in the early 1990s, after which the Army Corps of Engineers set about rebuilding Rockaway Peninsula's beaches using sand dredged from close to shore. They uncovered hundreds of submerged artifacts from the Hog Island days, including whiskey bottles, beer mugs, lamps, and other furnishings. But no pigs. 
1993, Hong Kong unveiled the Central Mid-Level Escalator, a giant walkway system that's now the longest outdoor covered escalator in the world. Though it's often referred to as the escalator for short, the structure is actually made up of 20 different escalators and three moving walkways. The entire structure covers over 2,600 feet in distance across an elevation of over 440 feet in the air, and it makes it much easier to travel between the hilly middle and central levels of Hong Kong Island. It's even programmed to help ease rush hour traffic. In the mornings, the system runs downhill, allowing residents from up high in the hills to get to work on time. If you bring a sled with you to the escalator, you can get to work early. After 10 a.m., all the escalators run uphill to give commuters' knees a needed rest. The project was first publicly discussed in the early 1980s, after city planners discovered that the area's topography made it challenging to place roads in convenient spots, and that increased demand for routes running north and south were creating huge traffic jams on east-west streets. In total, the system took two and a half years to build, at a cost of around $31 million. It was totally worth it though, as today, it's not just an added convenience for residents of a crowded, difficult to walk neighborhood, but a major tourist attraction that's lined with restaurants, bars, shops, and endless, what if we kissed on the giant escalator, memes. Speaking of challenging topography, we move over to the Republic of Singapore an island country that's essentially a modern city-state. While Singapore consists of 63 total islands, and the country has increased its surface area via land reclamation projects, it's still an almost entirely urban country, which has lost an estimated 95% of its rural areas and historical forests. In fact, Singapore has the second highest population density of any country in the world. Yeah, really. To make up for the lack of a rural interior or hinterland, Singapore's city planners purposefully set out to make it the greenest city within Asia. Vast green spaces have been incorporated into the design of the city, both to give residents a way to connect to the natural world and for the ecological and clean energy benefits. In 2007, an estimated 47% of the city's total land area was covered by greenery. The tropical palm tree has become one of the many icons of Los Angeles, California, along with the Hollywood sign and $20 an hour parking garages. In fact, the palm tree has become a shorthand symbol for the city itself. So it is downright shocking to discover that palm trees are not actually native to Southern California. That's right, the tree is a lie. For most of its history, the area was entirely palm treeless. In the late 1800s, Franciscan missionaries from Spain began planting the trees in the area for entirely practical purposes. They needed a handy supply of palm fronds to use during religious services, particularly around Palm Sunday. By the time Southern California experienced a major population boom in the late 19th century, palm trees were already plentiful, and real estate developers felt that they gave the area a dramatic and exotic look that made it even more visually appealing to Americans living in chilly East Coast climates. With all eyes on the young city, even more palms were planted around Los Angeles in the lead up to the 1932 Olympics. Many of the trees planted during this era are still alive and dotting the LA landscape today. Eh, their apartments must be rent controlled. So what do you think? Which one of these unusual city facts surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history.